Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In the head, soft tissue sparsely covers the underlying skull. The palpation of its bony contours provides a dental practitioner with an accurate key to the individual patient. The techniques of local anesthetic administration, physical diagnosis, orthodontic analysis, prosthetic impressions, and design, as well as many surgical procedures of dentistry, are premised on a mastery of the skull osteology. For the beginning and advanced anatomy student, the skull provides a three-dimensional framework upon which to construct his developing knowledge of soft tissue relationships. It is the purpose of this tape to provide a ready introduction and review of osteology. When combined with a first-hand examination of the skull and further study of a good osteologic text, this tape will help the student to develop a thorough working knowledge of the head. The complex of bones known as the skull can conveniently be divided into two parts. The neurocranium, which is basically housing the brain and its cord structures, the base, and the facial region. The neurocranial region, or cranium, can be divided up, or is made up, of eight bones, two of which are paired and four are single. The paired bones, we can see here in the side view of the skull, we have is the temporal bone and a much larger bone, the parietal bone. The unpaired skull bones of the neurocranium would be the frontal bone, and this is probably best shown by looking at the sutural system in this area. The frontal bone, in this aspect, and then on the posterior aspect of the skull, the occipital bone, which you can see outlined here. The other two bones making up the neurocranium are basically midline bones and found internally, except in the case of the sphenoid bone, which in the region of the temporal fossa makes up this portion of the temporal fossa. We can see here the greater wing of the sphenoid. If we were to disarticulate the skull and remove the sphenoid, we have a, an example of the sphenoid bone here. The sphenoid bone is basically made up of then a lesser and greater wing as seen from this interior view. And it is this greater wing of the sphenoid, which we have seen making up the lateral aspect of the temporal fossa. The other bone, which is going to make up a part of the neurocranium, is the ethmoid bone. And this is basically located centrally at the base of the brain, and we'll see it better when we look at the interior of the base of the skull. The bones of the neurocranium are joined together in a sutural system, and the sutures of which have specific names. The suture, which joins the frontal bone to the parietal bones, is known as the coronal suture. You'll notice it joining a second sutural system here at this point, and this is the mid-sagittal suture, which will pass all the way back to a junction with another sutural system with the occipital bone. The mid-sagittal suture 
is the junction then of the two parietal bones in the midline. At the base of the skull, the occipital bone, which we can see outlined here, adjoins the parietal bone seen here and the midsagittal suture to form the lambdoidal suture system, a lambda, as you can see at this point. The other sutures of this system, the neurocranium, make up, for example, <clears throat> and can be shown in the infratemp or in the excuse me, the temporal fossil region. We can see the and are named really uh, for the bones which they adjoin. For example, here is the squamous portion or flat portion of the temporal bone adjoining the parietal bone, the temporal parietal suture. Similarly, we have a sphenofrontal suture in this region, a sphenoparietal suture in this area, and so forth. But let's look at some of the features of the neurocranium in terms of its surfaces. Located above the lambdoidal region, we'll find two foramina. These are the parietal emissary vein foramina. These will transmit emissary veins to the diploe and venous sinuses of the skull. On the occipital bone, one can find a prominent external occipital protuberance. The external occipital protuberance has emanating from it a series of lines. They are called the nuncal lines and are associated with the attachment of the deep neck musculature. The highest nuncal line, which you can see in this region, is the attachment of the galea aponeurotica of the skull. Here we have the superior nuncal line and about midway between forum and magnum and the occipital protuberance, we have the inferior nuncal line. If we continue toward the base of the occipital region, there is a prominent feature, the mastoid process. The mastoid process, it can be seen, has two grooves associated with it. The groove for the posterior digastric and the occipital groove, which is located here for the transmittance of the occipital artery. The occipital bone surrounds a large opening in this area, the foramen magnum. But these other features of the base of the skull we'll discuss separately as we get to that part of our discussion. The facial skeleton or visceral cranium is that part of the face and is made up of two prominent portions. In making up the facial skeleton, there are 14 bones, 12 of which are paired and two are single. The most prominent single one, the mandible. The bones that make up the facial skeleton, we can see here the maxilla, and its pair from the opposite side. The zygomatic bone and then we get into a group of bones which are going to make up the orbit. The orbit 
located here is made up of a series of bones, the roof of which we have already identified as being the frontal bone. As we pass medially in the orbit, we can begin to see a portion of that remaining midline bone that I mentioned earlier as a part of the neurocranium. And here it actually makes up a part of the facial skeleton. And that is the ethmoid bone, which is located here. The other prominent <coughs> midline bone is the lacrimal bone located in this position. The, you can see it a little better here, lacrimal bone. You will notice a projection of the maxilla in this region. The floor of the orbit is made up of the orbital plate of the zygoma and of the maxilla. Its lateral wall <coughs> is also made up of the zygoma and we can see that a portion of the frontal bone passes into this region. Most prominently, the lateral wall is made up of a portion of the greater wing of the sphenoid. One final bone makes up the orbital wall, and that is the palatine bone. It will project to the inferior medial aspect of the orbit. It's a very hard area to show, and it's quite deeply located. But if we look deep within the orbit, we can see on this inferior medial aspect the palatine bone as it projects to this region. So now we have looked at the bones that make up the orbit, which are a part of this facial complex. As we look at the front of the skull, there are still two bones which we've not mentioned yet. The nasal bones located at the bridge of the nose. And finally, if we look into the nose, we can begin to see some of the remaining facial skeleton, which we'll see better when we look at the sagittal view of the skull. But here in the midline, we can see two bones that make it up. One, the vomer inferiorly, and superiorly, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. On the lateral walls, we can see the coeni, or the, excuse me, the inferior and middle conchs. If we look at the lateral view, of the facial skeleton, we can see that the maxilla does project back into this region. And again, the palatine bone will present a small portion, the pyramidal portion of the palatine bone, which in this particular skull, you can see is partially broken down. But it is a small pyramid-shaped piece of bone that fits in behind the maxilla. Coming into the posterior aspect of the face, we can see another midline bone, or part of the sphenoid, in this case, the lateral pterygoid plate. We'll again discuss that when we get to the base of the skull. The palatine bone is probably more easily recognized in its horizontal projection, making up the posterior part of the bony palate. And here you can see the horizontal portion of the palatine bone. Now, we would like to look at the contours 
and surface features of the facial skeleton. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.